In this question and answer live with Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, you will hear about three topics. One, Rabbi Goldberg has been called a heretic. He's been accused of bringing a missionary into his shul. He addresses those statements, he addresses that whole idea, and I think he pretty much clears things up. Number two, the Kosal is a big campaign to be united, to stand as one, and to reject any mixed prayer section of the Kosal. A question that was sent in by a subscriber was, should we sacrifice what we want to avoid Machlokas? And number three, a few weeks ago, Rav Herschel Schachter wrote a letter. The only issue is, is that he didn't write the letter. A letter went around everywhere condemning Rabbi Goldberg, but it wasn't him who wrote it, it was forged. And a day like today where forgery is so simple and so easy, how do we know what's true and what's not true? Many people go through the doors of Chaim Kanievsky and a lot of letters come out, a lot of signatures come out. Is there a way to figure out, okay, well this one is real and this one isn't? We discuss all these topics in this video. If you enjoy, please go ahead and leave a like, a comment, and of course, subscribe. Welcome, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, back to the hot seat. How are you? Well, thank you, Nach. Great to be here. It's good to see you. It's good to see you had a successful event this week in, in BRS, I heard. We did, and I want to give a big thank you and shout out to you and Meaningful Minute for your partnership. It was really oh, thank you. Share it and work on it and do it together. We had a packed house in person. I understand we had a packed house online, and uh, it was it was really great partnership and a, a magical, magical evening. We're still flying high. Baruch Hashem, it was beautiful. It was really an honor and a pleasure. What do you say we jump right in? Let's go. Do it. Okay. Rabbi Goldberg, you have been the subject of a lot of criticism lately. Um, a heretic, um, Hitler's rabbi, some headline online would, would show, some awful, awful things uh, were said about you for um, an event that you had in Boca Raton a couple of weeks ago uh, featuring Ben Shapiro, David Friedman, Governor DeSantis, and one other individual. Well, I don't know his name even, but um, people are, are saying that you invited a missionary to your shul. And I just want to give you the opportunity to, to speak to that. And, um, yeah. So um, it was an enormously successful event. We had a 1,000 people there and the pack of Jews and non-Jews. It was done together with the Latino Coalition for Israel. And it was an evening to combat anti-Semitism, to stand up for Israel. Um, and I'm really grateful. It was an enormous success. We did it in partnership, as I said, with the Latino Coalition for Israel, and it did attract some negative attention. Um, look, the attention it attracted was from people who are not, let's just call them mainstream, not accepted, believed. Uh, everything we do at Boker Ton Synagogue, we believe in Das Torah. We believe in our Rebbeim. We believe in Tamidei Chachamim. We believe in Gedol Yisrael. And we believe that even if we are inspired to be entrepreneurial or creative in doing a program, for a good reason. I promise you I got nothing out of the evening. There was no money in my pocket. There certainly was no honor or fame. Uh, what I got out was needing extra security, uh, death threats, protection. Um, and so there was no agenda and there was no motivation other than to stand up for Israel and to stand up against anti-Semitism. So well, even we have creative entrepreneurial ways of uh, doing things, that we thinking of doing things, we do everything asking Rebbeim. I, I speak to my Rebbe, Mori Varabi Reb Shechter, I'm very close with other great Rabbanim. Uh, and on this topic, we speak to Rav Yitzhak Adlerstein, Rabbi Adlerstein, who's a Musmach of Chavz Chaim, is a Ben Torah, he's a Tamil Chacham, he's the director of Inter Affairs for the Wiesenthal Center. And I refer you, anyone who's listening, who wants to understand more in-depth interfaith issues and the difference between dialogue, which we don't believe in, we don't believe in religious dialogue, we don't believe in religious engagement, religious study, comparative religion, we don't believe in any of that. But cooperation, not only do we believe in, everybody believes in. I hate to break it to you, Nachi. It was the, the, the two individuals, and I will not stoop to their level by Khalila calling them a name or, or anything like that. The two individuals who I think are severely misguided and, and have whatever agendas they have, um, they, you know, they turn their ire towards me for whatever reason, but they get equally pointed towards, and I can go on and on, I don't want to take up all of our time right now, but telling you the recipients, the beneficiaries, or the very people who cooperate on a regular basis with other religions. Whether it's Agudas Yisrael cooperating with the Archdiocese of New York to help pay for parochial schools or reopen schools and shuls during Corona, you're helping reopen churches. You're helping getting money for churches. Why were they allowed to do that? They're right. very cooperate. Whether it's Migdal Or of Grossman, who received money from Pastor E on a regular basis, and whether it's just a few months ago, 
Mayne HaYeshua Hospital, Haredi Hospital in Tanya, led by and with the consent of the, uh, the Sons Kloisenberger received incubators, other important medical equipment that was sponsored by Christians, evangelicals in America. The cooperation is going on all the time. It doesn't often go on in a shul. It goes on at APAC, at JNF, at uh, other venues, or they just receive a check from those places. Or I go to Israel, there are meetings that happen behind closed doors. In our case, we felt um, we had an agenda. This was before anyone was held hostage in Texas. This was before anti-Semitism has come back on the agenda. But we all know that we're afraid of it, and it's a grave concern. And, and we need to turn to those who care and are sensitive and are willing to step up and stand out on it. So the event and the person that we did it with, a person who was vetted, by the way, a pastor who leads the Latino Coalition for Israel, was vetted and does not missionize. And um, so that, I think that's an, an important thing right there. I, um, I can't, and we've discussed this, I can't even tell you how many messages I got, um, you know, about the situation over there and and people would really go to and say Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg brought a missionary into his shul there are people who are uh, susceptible to being converted to evangelical Christianity in Boca Raton and Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg is is bringing that person to his shul um, that statement can you yeah either agree with it or squash it like go with it ever 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 agree with it we would never ever bring a missionary to our shul of course not we combat missionaries we once a year twice a year every other year i find out there's a missionary in the neighborhood handing out literature knocking on doors we drive them from the neighborhood we raise our voice we say not in our backyard get lost because those people are actively trying to missionize and convert and that's a real issue and the jewish people have to be vigilant we have to care about and we have to confront that issue there is a fundamental difference between people who missionize and evangelicals who we can cooperate with when they have been properly vetted. Again, I refer you really to the Behind the Bima and the hour interview with Rabbi Anderson, where he really unpacked it. But I'll just tell you, because this is the real key Nakuda, this is the key point, that, that not only should people listen to, but you should see the emails I got today apologizing. Not, not the actual main agitators, who would never apologize. They continue right. to forge letter from Rabbi um, Embarrassing, shameful. They would never apologize. But some of the people swept up in their mob mentality have come to learn more about the subject and realize that they were wrong and have actually come out and, and apologized. And interesting, chose to apologize and ask to preserve the anonymity, even though they had no problem using their name when they you know, posted and emailed and uh, spread whatever that they did. So the fundamental difference is, is the following. Um, evangelical means to, to missionize in the sense that just like every Jew who says Aleinu and talks about at the end of Aleinu, our dream and our hope that every human on earth one day will see Hashem Achad Achad, we have a vision for B'nai Noach that they should keep the second Noachide laws. So Nachi, you and I both have a fundamental belief and a vision for the way every non-Jew should live. And yet, we don't missionize, we don't knock on doors, we don't proselytize, we don't actively recruit to convert. So similarly, there are missionaries who we should combat and oppose and confront. And then there are evangelicals who have a vision, but yet they do not missionize. What's amazing is the following. Evangelicals believe in the land of Israel. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. They believe whoever blesses the Jewish people is blessed, whoever curses is cursed. Most of our people, they think that's a nice idea. It's a nice thought. It's a good for it. They believe it to their core. If they attach themselves and they bless and they support the Jewish people, they will be blessed. And if they do the opposite, then they will be cursed. They believe it. They believe it to their core. So they are committed. First of all, they apologize for the history of Christian persecution and oppression. They take responsibility, evangelicals. They recognize their role in it. And they believe that they need to bless the Jewish people and protect the land of Israel. They fund them, they, they, their commitment to support the land of Israel, the state of Israel, supersedes, it's doche, it's more important to them than, than missionizing. So, and they understand that if the cost of cooperating with Jews on supporting Israel is that they can't missionize, they won't missionize. So, Nachi, I want you to listen to this irony and everybody listening. When you engage and when you cooperate and when you combat anti-Semitism and stand up for Israel, you are neutralizing the missionary activity. And when you call and hand postcards and threaten, when you dismiss and when you mistreat, then you are actually encouraging the missionizing. So if anyone is concerned about missionizing, there is certain outrageous behavior, which is only promoting and increasing it versus what we did, which was to speak to Arabeim, Yepsak, to work with Rabbi Adlerstein, a Ben Torah Musmach, Kolo graduate, who was the Director of Interfaith Relations Affairs for Wiesenthal Center, who vetted the people that we work with and stand up for Israel. A thousand people passed 
and they did not discuss the Bible or God or Christian or any comparative religion. They heard from Ambassador David Friedman, a from Yid. They heard from Ben uh, Shapiro, a from Yid. They got great opening remarks from Governor DeSantis and Senator Scott, who are not from Yidden, but they are very uh, devoted to Israel elected leaders. Um, and we honored our Congressman uh, Ted Deutsch, and uh, he wasn't able to join us, but we recognized his leadership. And in the end, we made a major, major um, effort that there are two bodies of Hadar Golden and Oron Shaul that have been unjustly held by Hamas for seven years. Hamas war ended seven years ago, and after a ceasefire, Hamas came out and shot and killed these two young men, took and kidnapped their bodies, and for seven years have refused to release them. Against all international law, against all human rights, against everything. So we got a thousand people in the room, Jews and non-Jews, to reach out to elected officials and to say, no money can go to rebuild Gaza unless it's conditional on the release of those bodies. The United States should not put one penny, Congress must not approve one penny going to Gaza rebuilding unless it's conditioned on the release of those two bodies. Do you know what it meant when I sent that to, to, to Hadar Golden's parents, to Leah and Simcha Golden? When I sent them the video, and when I sent them a thousand people in a room standing up for their son, for Aron Shaul, fighting. So, you know, the people who hand out postcards, the people, and I'm, I don't want to make this the conversation, but the people right. who track down my children, I'm not talking about my married children. I'm talking about my married daughter's cell phone number and harassed her. My Are brother's phone numbers that, that harassed her. I'm talking that about, happened. I'm talking that about, happened? The, yeah, that happened. The vivid graphic death threat that I received and that our shul received that the FBI is still investigating and will track down and somebody will go to prison for the federal crime of the email with the threat that they sent. The behavior, forging a letter from Rav Shechter, all out of ignorance. We did nothing wrong. Speak to Gedol Israel, speak to Rav Shechter, speak to Rabbi Adersin, become educated on this issue. And it doesn't mean you have to do it. A lot of my colleagues, friends, they're not doing this in their shul. I respect that. It's not for everybody. Not everybody needs to run a program like that. That's okay. Never did I ever take to the airwaves and say, everybody must do this. Even again, Agoda cooperates, Rev Grossman cooperates, and uh, countless other examples I can give you of cooperation. But I'm not suggesting everyone needs to. I am suggesting that if somebody who has worked hard for the community for a long time, who has wonderful rebellion and tries to live within their boundaries they set, give that person the benefit of the doubt. Educate yourself. Don't get swept up in a mob mentality. Don't call names. Don't post lies. Don't promote slander. And certainly don't connect or associate with people who issue death threats and harass young children. It's shameful. Shameful. That's awful. That's awful. I mean, wow. That's really disgusting. I mean, we know the people who are behind, you know, leading the, uh, the opposition to you. And those people are very vocal on, on social media and, and their followers are very vocal. And I hope that, you know, I hope that the FBI does find who is responsible for that because there's, there's like no place for any of that in this world. That's disgusting. Correct. And you know what? Their mission and our mission is Kirov. We want to bring people close. We want to model respect and unity and love. We could disagree. We could disagree. We have important disagreements. You and I don't agree on everything. And we certainly don't agree with every Jew, with everyone within orthodoxy and certainly outside of it. We don't agree with everyone. But, but why don't we disagree about ideas? You know, if somebody made a video and they said, I heard Rabbi Adlerstein's explanation, I heard Goldberg's explanation, I understand he has good motive and I understand he's following his rabbi. here's why I still do. That's okay, we have disagreements about brain death and land for peace. We have disagreements about Borer and opening cans and bottles and Chavez. We have a lot of disagreements. Disagreements are perfectly okay. But how why, do we do But why, you know, I, I, I had with something I was dealing with today, I had, um, what you're describing is similar scenario where um, I was explaining something to somebody and they weren't hearing the explanation. They were just, oh, well, it said this. Well, let me explain to you what it means. And they don't want to hear. Like, what, why, why, what is that? Why are we so quick to, to judge? And um, I don't want to get back into this sort of cancel culture discussion, but we sort of like, write it off and I'm sorry, I'm not getting involved, I'm done, that's not for me, close, finish, it's awful. Like, we're, again, we always come back to the nuance, but time and time again, we're, we're like, there's an issue. I don't say there's an issue for college, so it's an issue for the whole world, but, but like, what can be done about this? Because it's not getting better. 
problem. I, listen, I think whatever's happening in the world around us happens within our world as well. It sweeps in. So whether it's the media or whether it's politics or whether it's even the way people root for sports, the level of divisiveness and the partisanship, people digging their heels. And, you know, they're very, they're very stuck. The world right now is very stuck in a model of win-lose. Meaning for me to be right, you have to be wrong. It can't just be I believe what I believe what you believe, but for me to feel good about myself, I have to show that you are wrong. And, and that's horrible. I'll tell you why I'm heartened and I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. Because I really believe in my core and what I've experienced in my life is that the fringes are fanatical in both directions. In both directions in politics, in both directions in religion, in both directions in almost everything, the fringes are extreme. But I believe that the majority, who mostly are silent, I have some thoughts about that. It's time for yeah. this. But the majority who are mostly silent, they get it. And they're as turned off as you and I. And they watch it. And they want to see messages. Well, why are you... And you and I have become good friends and we don't need to exchange platitudes. So these aren't empty words. You know, I already got your sponsorship for our Weinberger event. I don't, I don't need to just say nice things about you. So, but Meaningful Minute is so successful. Why? I've never seen one minute video that goes out that says, this person's a heretic. This person's going to burn in Gehenom. This person's going to drop dead. This person needs to be out. There's never been one minute that's been negative. That's been critical. One minute has put anyone down. Every minute is about being better, being our best selves, unity, love, faith, observing Torah, mitzvahs, everything. So that's why you've got a gazillion followers. And that's why, you know, our messages are getting out because that's what people are desperate for. And that's what they want. And that's what, and that's what heals. That doesn't mean that rabbis and, and, and platforms don't also need to get messages across sometimes about accountability and being better and living up to who we could be. Of course, we have to get those messages out. But do we do it with love? Do we do it with action? Do we do it with credibility? Or are we doing it with hate and knocking people down? My my father just texted me as I guess he's watching this live. He said, he said uh, in regards to what you were mentioning, um, that's it's a, a big reason why uh, people can only be happy with the weather in Florida as long as it's freezing in New York. Like if they're from New York and they go to Florida and it's seventy five in New York and it's eighty in Florida, doesn't it doesn't cause you know because they need a need, need to be right. <laughs> they need to make the smart move. Exactly, it's got to be a win lose. I've only won no. if you. And Covey, yeah. Covey talks about in the seven habits, win-win. That's a great model for life. I think Elo Ve'elo and Shimon Panam Torah is all about a win-win. We can disagree as long as you have Das Torah and I have Das Torah and we're not neither broken out of the boundaries of what's okay. We don't have to agree. We can both win. There's a book I read about uh, from a, a famous um, attorney. His name is Robert Shapiro, I believe. Not Shapiro, Shapiro. He was always asked if he's Jewish. He said, no, it's Shapiro, not Shapiro. Yes. Although I think, it's, I think it's the same spelling. And uh, he wrote a book on, on negotiating tactics and skills. And his big thing was um, no, a, a win-lose a win is ultimately a lose for the winner because you'll never win again with that person who lost. In negotiating, if you negotiate so well that that person lost, they're never going to go back to the table with you. It needs to be a, a big win versus a small win. Everyone needs to win in order for it to be successful. Um, so I think... When, after Korach's rebellion, Rish Baruch performed several miracles in order to eliminate Korach and his cohorts and in order to elevate, to show that Aaron, in fact, and Moshe were the chosen leaders. And then at the end, all of a sudden, he's got, you know, one more with the, with the staff, with the Am and the blossoms. Why? Why was that necessary? The ground had literally opened up and swallowed Korach. So I saw an insight once that, you know, you can be, you can be higher than someone either because you knocked them down so they're lower than you or because you took a step up. So don't be, don't be taller because you've knocked someone else down. Be right. taller because you're rising to the occasion. And rise to the occasion. Preach, teach, stand for values. You take on ideas. I've written some controversial articles or said some things that I believe in, but I've tried at least, I mean, maybe I failed, and for that I would be accountable. But I've tried to not make them personal. They're about ideas, they're about values. We're debating <laughs> people, never about name calling, never about knocking people, but, but are trying to rise up. There's a couple more, a couple more questions I want to get to. There's one in the question box. Um, so one in the question box that I want to highlight. With the recent story about the Kosel, um, is it a good idea to compromise in a separate prayer area in order to end Machlokes at the Kosel? Um, for those who don't know, there's uh, the the Kosel is at risk of having an area partitioned off that will be used for mixed prayer uh, and run by Reform and conservative rabbis. Um, so this question is, is it a good idea to compromise 
on a separate prayer in order to end the Machalik of I'm assuming that this question, the questioner is saying, should we just give in to end, to end Machalikas? It's a great question. I don't even feel adequate or appropriate to answer to a certain extent. I think that our brothers and sisters in Israel, as much as the, the Kosal, the Kotel, whatever you call it, belongs to all of us, and we all yeah. go, arguably, we from Chutlar spend more than most of the people who live in Israel. Um, but until we're citizens and until we have our skin in the game and until we're on the front lines, I'm not sure um, on the one hand. On the other hand, it does belong to all of us and it is a holy place. I, I will say that, and here's a perfect example of what we were just talking about. We can stand up for our values. We can say why Torah's MS, Torah's Moshe, Halacha, why we believe this is true since this is Pasha's Yisro. Since the Torah was first given 3,300 years ago, this has been our path and this is the Torah. And any novel or reinterpretations or misinterpretations of Torah for the last one, two, three hundred years, they don't have a right to uproot our chazaka on truth. And we can, we can take that stance and we can defend that value and we should, we should. And I often say that, you know, we have to be sensitive to Reformed, Conservative, Unaffiliated. We have to be sensitive to other Jews, but we also have to be sensitive to our We're also in a relationship with Hashem. Hashem is also our Reya. He's also our friend. And also, Hashem Shir Hashirim. He's also someone we... And so, as much as we have to be sensitive and care of people and feelings, we also have to be very sensitive and rise to the occasion of what Hashem depends on us for and depends on us to be the spokespeople and advocates for. So, on the one hand, on the one hand, the Rebun Shalom is counting on us to not dilute our values in our Torah, to not allow it to be distorted or corrupted, to not allow it to morph or change into anything which Halila, simulation, intermarriage, the experiment, the experiment of other denominations is and has been, and I apologize, I'm sure I'll get in trouble and offend people for saying this, but by any objective measure, it's an abysmal failure. There's what is? Reform and conservative. There is a more than 70 intermarriage rate in America. Assimilation. I did get in trouble and I wrote an article with a lot of love a year or two ago and I talked about you know the level of assimilation and intermarriage and other denominations have simply moved the goalposts. Instead of mourning and grieving, instead of recognizing maybe we got it wrong by abandoning or reinterpreting uh, Torah and mitzvot, maybe we got it wrong because it's not working. 70% are not just not observant, they are, they are marrying out, they're intermarrying and the disappearance and hemorrhaging of our people at rates and speeds We've never what, does that say, what does that say about the reform and conservative movement? Yeah, listen, I think this, here, here's where I think, and again, nuance. I think we have to differentiate between... This is a nuance, a nuance zone. No one, you know, like, don't worry. <laughs> I think we have to differentiate between um, their ideology and policies, which we have to oppose and we have to confront, and we have to differentiate with the people who we have to love. That's a because, very because point. because they're Jews. It's not easy to do that. Not easy to do that. I you know I put a picture of myself with a reform rabbi that I have a relationship with, that we have collaborated on things that we can have in common. And he knows he knows what we disagree vociferously about. But there are things that we cooperate on. And there's a woman who emailed me. She used to listen to every share I gave. She could never listen to me again because I posted that picture. And I didn't look at that picture and say, you know, it, it's a legitimate denomination or ideology or alternative. Uh, that he's a Jew and he's a friend. And I'm not the first. The days had a famous reform colleague he exchanged letters with. Rabbi what, if, what if somebody just sees that picture of you in, with, him, with him in no context? And they could go ahead and think, oh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg is buddies with this reform rabbi. Oh, he must think that what he, uh, what he preaches and what he's about um, is, is just and it's okay. Is that a concern? Is that a reason, especially nowadays when there is no nuance and when people are so quick to judge, maybe a picture with a reform rabbi could end up uh, rightfully so spiraling out of control and lead to the wrong stuff. Would you agree with that? Let me ask you a question. Do you think, what, what's the greater likelihood that a reform Jew sees an Orthodox Jew who's willing to say that this reform person is my friend and now they're willing to be open-minded about Orthodoxy? Now they'll accept the invitation to partner in Torah. Now they'll accept the invitation for Share One Shabbos of the Shabbos Project. Now they're willing to open their mind. Or are you more concerned that one of my Orthodox 
con- congregants, mispalim, friends, is going to say, Goldberg, who we know as a Ben Torah, is able to, to have a friendship with a reformed person, so it must be reformed Judaism is okay. I don't have to keep Shabbos anymore. I don't have to keep Osher. Is that a real fear? Is that, is that a real concern? Where's the other... I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and, and not to go back into the whole, um, you know, missionary discussion, when I was sort of discussing it with somebody, my, my stance was, do you really think that somebody um, from Boca Raton Synagogue is, is going to be converting to Christianity because this person is speaking there. Do you really think that Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg is a missionary? Like, you think he's a missionary? Like, come on, like, don't you think it's a little bit outlandish? Do you think it's a little bit of a stretch or a little bit of a reach? Let me tell you a story. Yeah. Tell you a story. 12, yeah. 12, 13 years ago, there was a women's learning initiative in town that was done by a mix of conservative and some Orthodox women. And they invited my wife to speak on Tar Samishbacha. And it was not taking place in an Orthodox shul. We wouldn't have hosted it in our shul. And they invited my wife. So, you know, on the one hand, how could she participate in a program that will also nominations? On the other hand, what an opportunity to speak affiliated about Taras Mishpach, about Mikvah. So I called her up actually to the Gvul Yaivitz, who is one of my post game on many of these issues. And again, it's easy to shoot arrows. It's easy to watch a meaningful minute question and answer. It's easy to be on the internet and you know, spew hate. But Dola Yisrael have broad shoulders, they're the real deal. So I called Rav David Cohen. Again, Das Torah. I don't make a move without Das Torah. From Brooklyn? I'm, what? From, from Brooklyn? From Brooklyn. Rav David Cohen from Brooklyn. The Gvoyaivitz, one of the world-class post in America. Preeminent post in the world. A very, very close with Chaim Kanievsky. Everybody knows Rav David Cohen. He's a huge, huge post I, I was his waiter for a few years in Camp Monk. There you go. Okay. So, so He tips very well. He tips very well. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. He does. I don't know. Whatever. Go on. <laughs> I, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. So I was 100% ready for David Cohen to say to me, are you out of your mind? Your wife, a from woman, is going to go speak in that joint program? And, and her name will appear on a program that also has, has speakers of other denominations? Absolutely not. What are you thinking? You know what he said to me? She's mechuyiv to go. I said, Rabbi, she's mechuyiv to go? He said, listen to me. Listen to his insight. Listen to why he's Rav David Cohn. He said to me, if an Orthodox Jew wants to hear a female reform rabbi today, he or she can go on the internet and listen to them all day and night. The fact that you're on the same program is not what's going to introduce them. He said, but on the other hand, an unaffiliated Jew is going to hear your Rebetzin speak about Tars Meshpacha, and she might go to the mikvah once, and she might save herself and her husband from an Isser Kares, she absolutely should go speak. I was blown away. I was shocked. I didn't see that coming whatsoever. I wasn't even sure why I was asking the Shaila. I was sure he was going to say it's Elser. But that's what he said. That's what he said. So we have to rely on our Gedoli Yisrael with their vision, with their breath, with their broad shoulders. They're able to see deeper and they're able to see further and farther. And they're able to guide us. Whether it was that issue 12 years ago or whether it was the issue two weeks ago, whether it's whatever issue you're going through today. And we can't act on our own. We can't be creative on our own and act outside the boundaries and, and not have Rebbe and Das Torah that we consult with. And they're not always going to say yes. They're going to push back and say, you're going too far. You're pushing too hard. But coming back to the Kotel, the Kotel for a minute. What I'll say is, on the one hand, we represent the Rebun and He's counting on us to preserve and protect his vision for his world. On the other hand, we just have to do it with sympathy and sensitivity. Uh, again, to the people who have a lot of ideas, I don't know, Nachi, how if you have relationships with any unaffiliated or reformer conservative Jews. There are very passionate reformer conservative Jews who have no background, they're Tinok Shanishba, no Jewish education, no upbringing with Jewish observance. They do not have the same things that we took for granted. And whatever connection they made, they're incredibly enthusiastic, passionate, and they're very devoted and often selfless about. And they feel, hey, you know, isn't that all the Jewish people's space? And can't we all go there? And, and can't you accept me? And so on and so forth. No, we can't. There are lines that we draw and there are lines that we cannot blur there are lines that we have to protect and defend, but we've got to do it with some love and some sensitivity. You know, when you cut the patient open for the surgery, or when you start to drip into their arm, just because you need to put the poison, just because you need to cut, the, just because you need to heal something, you've got to do it with love, with sensitivity, with warmth, with connection. You have to feel the pain. You want the surgeon to feel the pain of the patient. The nebuch, I have to cause this pain. I feel the pain. So sometimes... We have to, in order to heal, we have to cause pain, but at least we should share and feel that pain. I want to I sort of end up with one question. 
Last uh, two weeks ago, um, there was a letter going around that was uh, signed by Herschel Schafter, of course, which was a fake letter, which was forged and and it's not a real letter. Um, I think, of course, that is something that's very troubling and upsetting. That upsetting that someone would do that and that that could happen. But my question is, sort of, you know, uh, step down a, a level. We hear a lot of a lot of stuff coming out of Eretz Yisrael, um, supposedly coming out of the office of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, the house of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and other gedolim. And I sometimes think, and I know I know others as well, who have become very jaded, and they question, well, did Rav Chaim really say that, or what was explained to Rav Chaim that he that Rav Chaim answered this way? Um, the fear of agenda-driven people trying to get signatures or get certain haskamas put, I think, us all in a very vulnerable position when it comes to leadership from Das Torah across the ocean. What would you say uh, to that? Do we, you know, I, I had asked someone else and the person answered me, uh, no matter what, no matter what, how something is asked to Rev Chaim, he has a certain Ruach HaKodesh, which whatever he answers can already see you know, what the person asking is, I'm curious what, what you think about this, about this topic. I think that we have to be educated consumers of information. And whether that of what I went through the last few weeks and this fake letter of Schechter or the names I was called, whether it's true of people known as a negative thing to say about Meaningful Minute or you, but whether it's true about anything someone could say about you, we all, the burden is, us to be educated consumers of information. Fake news is a real thing. It's, it's real in the news and it's real in the Jewish news. There's a lot of fake news. So that's why you have to have time rebellion and, and count on our real time offline rebellion to say, hey, whether it's on health and wellness and vaccination, whether it's on hashkafa, whether it's on halacha, whether it's on whether, what we should be doing about the, the Kotel issue. We have to have real rebbeim and real teachers offline that we have relationships with, that we have access to, that we speak to, and allow them to filter what they're receiving and to be able to transmit it to us accurately. You can't, you know, the internet is a beacon of light. Where, where would you be? What would this platform be? They wouldn't exist. What the internet's done to share Torah and to share inspiration and to bring comfort and to bring light, it's just, it's extraordinary but it's also an enormous danger because anyone with a keyboard and an internet connection can say anything they want to say. They can lie, they can manufacture, they can distort, they can slander anything they want to say in anyone's name. And we know it, we've seen it. We've seen it recently from Mori Varabi of Schechter. Nechaim Kanievsky, there's been countless forgeries of things, distortions of things he said, the family corrected, he corrected. And throughout the ages, we've, we've had these this history, we've had these distortions. You know, there's a there's a based in uh, there's a based in somewhere, which is an illegitimate based in, and they faked a letter from Rav Akil Kotler, the Rosh of BMG, a beautiful letter on his stationery to them, saying how much he supports them and loves them and how wrong it is that other people don't recognize them. So someone sent me Rav Akil in his own handwriting on top of that letter wrote, "This is a ziyuf. This is a forgery." This is fake. I never wrote this. This is not real. Whether it's Rav Makiel, Kanievsky, whether it's Rav Schechter, the burden therefore becomes on us in this information age, secular information age, Jewish information age. The burden is on us to be educated consumers of information. The fact that somebody writes something, starts something, and you see the way it goes viral, it's unbelievable, like wildfire, it spreads. And then somebody later says, it's not true. They didn't say it. It's not true. The person wasn't missing. It's not true. They weren't missing anything. It's not true. What, so many examples in so many cases. So I guess I, I'm not being critical of Chaim or his Chatzar. I'm not being critical of the people who's got by him, Shamash around him. I'm putting the burden on us. Let us, let's be educated consumers. Let's be careful with what we read and how we filter it, how we confirm that it's true before we believe it. Let's be much more careful with what we're seeing and who we choose to see it from. Let's filter there's so much that comes down. It's like unbelievable wide on top. Filter it down and only let in, okay, I trust this person. I trust this platform. I trust this Jewish media. I trust this. And others have lost my trust. 
they've been willing to promote or share or write or say things that aren't true. So we have to become educated consumers. All right, Goldberg, before I let you go, I want you to, um, let's assume that the person who threatened you and threatened your family with death is watching this live. I want you to speak directly to them. What would you say? I would say to them, you must be in a lot of pain and you're very ill. And for that, I have sympathy for you and I pray for you. However, you have to be accountable for the threat, the danger that you caused and turn yourself in before we find you because the FBI will. Look, anyone who can do that kind of thing, you know, th there are people who with good intentions do bad things and there are people who are bad people doing bad things, right? We, we, there's, there's a line you draw. Some. When you harass ninth grade girls, harass them on their cell phone, personal cell phone. When you harass, you know, Bender was here last Shabbos. Yeah. You, know, you go to Darche, are you a Darche boy? Yeah. Oh, you are a Darche boy because I watch the meaningful people. Elementary. So I'm also a chief rockway boy for high school, but depends. Depends uh, where I am. Meaningful people, a meaningful people, Bender said you were a good boy. So we're going to, yeah. we do sure. not have, that is not fake news. That's good news. That's real news. So Rabender was here. Do you know that these maniacs, they got a hold of Rabender and they harassed him and told him not to come to Boca? Now, Baruch Hashem, Rabender is a very big person. He's phenomenal. He was unbelievable. Community still on a high. Of Bender in the way of Weinberg. What a, what a week it's been. Unbelievable. The Bender's a big person. But can, can you imagine? They get a whole, the Chil Hashem, the Chil Hashem they've caused. Chil Hashem is just, it's mind boggling. So I love all Jews. I even love the Jews who hate me. Maybe I love them the most. I love all Jews. I wish well for all Jews. And I want him to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to violate anyone's confidences, but we spent two years fighting for a get. I think we spoke about it on this program. We spoke about a meaningful minute of questions and answers. And about, six weeks, two months ago now, that get was finally given. It's a long story. It's a complicated story I was given. It was an effort of a lot of people and Baruch Hashem, Chasta Hashem, it was given. And after the get was given, the person who on the other side, who had acted in certain ways against all those who were trying to get the get, but after the get was given, the next week I had the opportunity to do something to help him. And I did. He gave the get. He stepped up. He did the right thing. So now my responsibility for a person who very publicly um, acted in ways that were uh, not appreciated, but I had an opportunity to help a fellow Jew, so I did. And I want you to know that after I did, that day, I was able to, I was in a position to be able to help him. I'm so grateful that I was. He came over to me and we had a conversation, which I don't want to divulge. I don't want to divulge because it was private. But, you know, he apologized and I told him I'm sorry. If I did things I could have done differently. We hugged it out. We actually met again today, trying to help him with something else. I love all Jews. Everybody. And, and I hope people love me. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. I make mistakes and I will make mistakes. Um, but there are mistakes within boundaries and sending graphic, vivid descriptions of the death threat of what you will carry out um, and harassing children. There's, there's a line. There's a line that even unworthy of love. So, you know, I just pray for, I daven for those people that whatever illness, mental illness, even for the, even for the people who are using the gift of the internet to promote hate against me and against Rabbi Sachs, Allah Vashalom, and against many others. I daven for them. I daven for them that they should wake up healthy and well. They have a koach, I'll tell you this. Maybe we'll end with this. If these individuals would pour their energy and their ambition and their creativity into, in fact, spreading light and amuna and love, they could bring Mashiach. These yeah, very, true. These <laughs> they definitely, definitely have a lot of energy. That's what we daven for. All right, Rabbi Goldberg, thank you so much for joining us once again. This live will be up here on Instagram to be rewatched and on YouTube as well. So I um, hope everyone has a beautiful Shabbos. Thank you, Rabbi Goldberg. Thank you, Nachi. Great to see you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for joining. And uh, welcome to the world of nuance. We're creating a movement. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, the nuance movement. So <laughs> thank you. Fantastic Shabbos, everybody. I hope, it's warm. I hope it's warm in Florida and in New York. Oh, thank you. Well, it's not, but thank you. <laughs> All the best. Be well.